Right, everyone, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Good afternoon. I'm Joshua Fisher. I'm the program director for the Planning House Presidency. Very good. Uh, and today I have the pleasure of introducing our Department of Family Medicine Grand Rounds guest speaker. Dr. Yelda Jabakar is the director of the Robert Graham Center for Policy Studies and Primary Care. She is an associate professor at the Georgetown University School of Medicine. She attended Georgetown for medical school and residency, where she was the chief resident while I was there for my sub -I. And then later to onboard me as an intern. So this is a special kind of uh, pride for me. Uh, after residency, she practiced family medicine for Scripps Health Medical Group in San Diego. She returned to Washington, D.C. in 2015 to serve as the Robert L. Phillips Health Policy Fellow at the Robert Graham Center. During this time, she practiced clinically at Unity Healthcare, the largest federally qualified health center in Washington, D.C. After fellowship, Dr. Jabakora was full-time faculty at the Georgetown University School of Medicine before transitioning to the Robert Graham Center in 2018. Many of you are familiar with the Graham Center, but for those who are not, the Graham Center is an important and influential primary care think tank in Washington, D.C. The research done at the Graham Center influences important conversations around many aspects of primary care and supports the policy and advocacy work of the AAF. And most important, Dr. Jabakor is a family physician. And I'm excited and looking forward to her talk this afternoon. And there will be a QR code at some point where you can register and get CME credit for today's grand rounds. Without further ado, I will hand it off to Dr. Jabakor. Thank you, Dr. Fisher. It's so good to see you after all these years. I <clears throat> wish I could be there in person. I'm at the other Washington, probably the less beautiful Washington. So I will make it over to Washington State at one point. Um, I am going to share my screen to get started. And you guys interrupt me if you can't see something um, or if um, you can't hear something. I will apologize in advance that I do have a pretty bad cough. So I may have to stop every once in a while to take sips of water. But I think those of you who are practicing right now know this cough because all your patients are coming in with it and it's lasting forever. So <laughs> I don't know how to get rid of it. Anyways, <clears throat> I hope to spend the next, let's say 30 minutes or so talking about the health of primary care in the United States and locally in Washington, um, using the 2024 scorecard report um, that the Robert Graham Center created with funding from the Physicians Foundation and the Millbank Memorial Fund as kind of a jumping off point to do that. So just some disclosures, this most of what I'm presenting, not all, but most of what I'm presenting was funded by the Millbank Memorial Fund and the Physicians um, Foundation. So I hope by the end of this, you all will understand why the primary care scorecard was created um, to begin with. Um, we'll explore what the data implies about the state of primary care in the nation and also locally for you all in the state of Washington. Um, we'll identify actionable policy solutions for the primary care crisis. I'm going to spend most of the next 30 minutes or so sharing data that you can find in the primary care scorecard. So perhaps it's important to actually tell you what that actually is and where you can go to find some more information that I won't cover today, if you are interested. The scorecard was first called for in the 2021 National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine report that was called Implementing High Quality Primary Care rebuilding the foundations of healthcare. In this report, the NASM committee called for five recommendations or objectives to move the nation towards the implementation of high quality primary care. One of those recommendations was around accountability and having a way to track year after year movement on the five recommendations put forth by the committee. So the Millbank Memorial Fund and the Physicians Foundation asked us at the Robert Graham Center to create such an accountability system, which is how the scorecard and the accompanying um, dashboard was created. The thought was that the Graham Center would be the testing grounds for these measures 
until a federal dashboard on primary care could be um, imagined, created. We're currently in the midst of creating our third scorecard with the Melbank Memorial Fund, which won't be finished until the winter, and it won't really be released until the end of February. So what I'm gonna show you here is really from our second scorecard. So what are these five recommendations that we are in charge of tracking? We looked at whether we are achieving payment for primary care teams to care for people, not doctors to deliver services, whether we are ensuring that high quality primary care is available to every individual and family in every community, whether we are training primary care teams where people live and work, whether we are designing information technology that serves the patient, family, and interprofessional care teams, and whether we are ensuring that high quality primary care is implemented in the United States. The NASM committee actually made our work at the Graham Center easier in that they actually gave metrics and proposed data sets in their report that we should use for our analysis. For the most part, we really tried to hold true to what the NASM committee recommended. So when they recommended um, pay for primary care teams to care for people, not doctors or deliver services, to deliver services, for example, they told us to track primary care spend, and that's what we did. The NASM committee also recommended that we only use publicly available data and that we are able to report fi uh, findings on a national and state level. Any of you who do health services research knows that this is a tall order, but we did get close. We used almost all publicly available data. There are two data sets that we used that were proprietary. Um, for each of the measures I will present, we attempted to use the publicly available data sets when possible. We also tried to calculate not only national numbers, but state numbers when the data allowed for it. That wasn't always. For some metrics, we found that publicly uh, available data really wasn't sufficient for the least populous states. So we could not calculate state measures for those states. Year one was an iterative process. <clears throat> Excuse me. We tried to calculate the metrics with a bunch of different data sets and in various ways. And we really spent a lot of time getting input from our steering committee and other stakeholders around the country who were working in similar areas. Ultimately, we arrived at the data that I will present today for year two. And really, as a, even though they're not perfect, as a researcher and primary care physician, we at the Graham Center really feel that the data in aggregate represent the health of US primary care pretty accurately. So before I get into to what the data showed, I did want to touch at a very high level on some of the definitions um, that we used and the data sets we landed on, just in case there are people out there who are thinking of doing similar analyses. So when I mention primary care throughout the presentation, I am talking about family physicians, general internal medicine physicians, geriatricians, general pediatricians, Med, uh, med peds doctors and NPs and PAs who are working in primary care. Uh, we do exclude hospitalists from the definition of primary care. So we are really talking about outpatient primary care. So when we do our workforce analyses that I'm gonna show you in the workforce section, this is how we did it. Basically for each year from 2012 to 2021, we started with data from the AMA master file, and that is proprietary. We did have to buy that to identify primary care physicians that are in direct patient care. Uh, PCPs that we considered in direct patient care excluded residents and excluded retirees. We also adjusted status based on age to adjust for the likelihood that physicians listed as being in direct contact with patients have actually retired because the AMA master file does not update regularly. It does update regularly, but it's not necessarily up to date with what's actually happening in the world. So if we found that there was a physician in there that was 70 years old, for example, we just counted them as retired 
Whether they were or not, we're not sure, but we just made an assumption. A growing number of um, physicians listed as primary care specialists, we notice, are also working as hospitalists or in emergency departments. So to identify and exclude these positions, we use the Medicare Part B public use file from 2012 to 2021, which really includes the volume of services rendered by each provider and what the service is. So with that data, we linked it to the AMA master file using an NPI crosswalk. Physicians identified as primary care in the AMA master file, master file who had more than 90% of their ENM codes from a hospital or emergency department rather than an office-based setting were excluded from our definition of primary care. So NPs and PAs were a lot harder to identify in um, the data sets. There's not a national workforce database comparable to the AMA master file for NPs and PAs. So what we did was we used the Medicare Provider and Supplier Enrollment System or PCOS data in conjunction with Medicare Part B public use files and the NPI database or the NPPES to identify NPs and PAs working in primary care. So how we did this was that we used an analysis that kind of built on our earlier attempts to identify NPs and PAs. What we could do is using the PCOS data, we could identify NPs and PAs who were actually in primary care offices based on the relative share of primary care physicians in the same practice location as them. So if we found that there was a practice location that had 95% primary care physicians and an NP and PA was also there, we just assumed that NP and PA was working in primary care. If the address led us to a multi-specialty practice like most of us work in now. We then took the share of physicians who were primary care and multiplied that by the NPs and PAs. For example, if we found in MedStar Health where I work, there were 30% um, primary care physicians of all the physicians there. We took all the NPs and PAs whose addresses went to MedStar Health and we multiplied it by 0.3, assuming that that share held true. For the training analysis that I'm gonna present, we used ACGME program level data to get the number of residents per program and their specialties. We used the area health resource file to get census level data in terms of population counts so that we could report the number of residents per capita. And then we rolled program level data up to the state or up to the nation, depending on the measure. For the analysis that we do looking at new entrants to primary care, this is a little bit more complicated. And it's more complicated because we know that just because you're in a primary care residency does not mean you actually end up practicing primary care. So what we did was we used a combination of the AMA historic residency file and the current AMA data um, from the wow. historic residency file so that we could see who graduated between 2011 to 2020. We could see in that file what program they were in and what specialty they were in. We then compared that to 2023 AMA data to make sure that those same residents that had graduated between 2011 and 2020 were still listed as having a primary care specialty in 2023. So in this way, we're pretty sure that we excluded, for example, an internal medicine resident, excuse me, <coughs> who graduated from an internal medicine residency in 2020, but then went into a cardiology fellowship in that same year. So by looking a few years after, we're pretty sure that who we got were actually primary care entrants. Sorry, taking a few sips. <coughs> For our payment analysis, we use the medical expenditure panel survey. I know many states are using their own 
primary, doing their own primary care investment analyses using state all payer claims databases. There is no national all payer claims database. And even though there are companies such as HCCI that have claims data for many Americans on a national level, um, they charge fees and our charge from the national, uh, the NASM committee was to use publicly available data. Therefore, we depended on the medical expenditure panel survey for this particular analysis. We used a provider and setting based definition in the METS data. Um, who we included in our numerator for our narrow definition was all outpatient expenditures for primary care physicians, which include, again, family physicians, general practitioners, pediatricians, um, med peds, geriatricians, and internists. That was our numerator. So any outpatient expenditure done by that um, particular specialist was included in our numerator. Our denominator was all total healthcare expenditures. So everything, including pharmaceuticals, including inpatient stays. <coughs> For our broad definition, we included primary care physicians as I defined above, but we also included nurse practitioners, physician assistants, psychiatrists, mental health non-physicians, and OBGYNs. We didn't include NPs and PAs in the narrow definition only because in the MEPS data, we cannot tell if an NP and PA is working in, for example, an outpatient surgical office, an outpatient cardiology office, or if they're actually working in a primary care setting. And that is why we put them in the broad definition. Okay, two more, two more analyses to um, go through before I get into the results. So for our technology analysis, we use the American Board of Family Medicine Continuing Certification Questionnaire. ABFM recently added interoperability questions to their recertification survey that many of you take. Um, they added this in 2022 in collaboration with the Office of the National Coordinator for Health Information, or ONC. Um, these questions ask family physicians to report on patient-generated EHR data, the capability and frequency of EHR usability, such as the ease of entering information, mm -hmm. ability of information, amount of information on the screen, workflow alignment, ease of finding relevant information, they also ask about overall EHR satisfaction and hours per day spent on EHR documentation outside of office hours. <clears throat> so that's the data source that we used for our technology and analysis. Um, for the measuring investment in primary care research, we used NIH Reporter. Our focus was to capture grant funding given to departments of family medicine at US medical schools because we felt like these institutions have traditionally housed primary care researchers and their staff only. So we excluded, for example, um, rewards given to departments of internal medicine because we felt a lot of those rewards actually end up going to subspecialty care and not necessarily primary care. So we are probably under reporting, but um, we, have compared our numbers to numbers that others get with much more robust analyses, including there's a RAND report that had a very robust analysis of research dollars going to primary care. And our numbers using this methodology aren't that much off. So there are several limitations to discuss with the data sources that I'll talk about real quick before before we get into the meat of the presentation. One is that the medical expenditure panel survey data is only available for 29 states. So we are excluding 21 states from the state level analyses. When we do the national level rollups using the medical expenditure panel survey, we do include all data from all states. We just can't tell you, for example, what it specifically is for the state of New Hampshire because there's not enough population in the state of New Hampshire to be able to do that. Um, AMA data, I already kind of talked about this, but they're not always up to date um, in terms of things like addresses, retirement, et cetera. They also do not include all DOs. So if there is a DO 
who went to a DO medical school and a DO residency before the merger of the allopathic and the osteopathic programs, they would not be in the AMA database. <clears throat> um, in terms of the ACGME data we used, it's program specific and not site specific. This matters because a lot of residency programs, you know, they're, they can be very big and their residents don't necessarily spend time, for example, at the site that's in the urban center. They're spending all their time in the rural center. We unfortunately cannot capture site specific data and match residents to sites. We can only match them to programs. Um, and then the technology data that we present is for family physicians only, not all of primary care, and there is no patient point of view. These data sets, I will say, have many more limitations than what I'm presenting here, but for the purposes of this presentation, these are the big limitations. Okay, so let's get into the second year scorecard report. The first year we did this scorecard, it was just to develop the measures and set the benchmarks. We didn't want to do the same exact report for the second year. We wanted to keep the measures the same so we could track it over time, but we wanted to have a different angle. And what we noticed was that access to primary care was becoming a huge issue in the lay media. So we really focused our second year report around this problem of access to primary care. <clears throat> I'm sure these headlines that have dominated the news about primary care in the last several years surprise no one that works in primary care or who has tried to get a primary care appointment in the last year. I actually hear this from my patients all the time. They have to wait months to see me or their friend who is new to the area is looking for a primary care clinician but is told that if they wanna use insurance, they'll have to wait up to a year to make an appointment with a new primary care physician. So access is severely limited. And as a result, primary care, the way it is currently set up really is failing Americans. But we don't only hear about this anecdotally or see it in the headlines. Our data actually backs up the fact that less and less Americans have access to a primary care clinician. Here we examined the percentage of Americans who report that they do not have a usual source of care that they can turn to when they need medical advice. Over the last decade, this percentage has continued to grow so that in 2021, which was the last year we were able to check, over a quarter of adults report no usual source of care and 13% of children report no usual source of care. And given how important a usual source of care or primary care is to managing chronic disease, identifying mental health issues, or providing preventive services like vaccinations, it's pretty alarming that so much of our population is without this care. So why is this happening? Well, there are many reasons, but in this year's report, we focus on these five reasons for why no one can see you now. First, the primary care workforce is not growing fast enough to meet population needs. Second, the number of trainees who enter and stay on the professional pathway to primary care is too low. Third, the United States continues to underinvest in primary care. Fourth, technology has become an added burden to primary care. And fifth, primary care research to identify, implement, and track novel care delivery and payment solutions is lacking. You'll notice that these five reasons that no one can see you now match perfectly with the five recommendations from the NASM committee as to how to get to high quality primary care in the United States. So, here we looked at first the number of primary care physicians per capita. A decade ago, we were sounding alarm bells that we did not have enough physicians to meet population needs. And now, 10 years later, despite the fact that we have growing numbers of patients with chronic disease and aging population, um, higher mental health needs, so higher demand, despite all that, instead of growing our primary care physician workforce, it's actually shrinking. 
I'll tell you, yes, it's not a large shrinkage. It's going from 68 um, primary care physicians per 100,000 population to 67. But the point is that we should not have fallen. We should have gone up given how much demand has increased over the last decade. When we add nurse practitioners and physician assistants to the mix, though, we see there has been an overall growth in the number of primary care clinicians per capita, which at first glance may actually seem really promising for the trajectory of our workforce. But the question is, is this number sufficient and is it sustainable? And the answer is likely not. And here's why I say that. One, if we compare this total clinician density to other countries, such as our neighbors to the north, we see that we are still grossly behind. So Canada's family physician per capita density in 2021 was around 130 family physicians per 100,000 population, which is quite literally off our chart because it's on another scale. And also, although NPs and PAs are critical to the healthcare workforce at, a, at large and also the primary care workforce, physicians, NPs, and PAs do receive vastly different training, they practice differently, and they are responsible for different types of patients and conditions. So the workforces are not just a one for one replacement. If they were, then certainly accessing primary care over time would have improved or at least stayed the same and not gotten worse since the clinician workforce overall is growing. But also it's not sustainable because as some of our data shows in the scorecard and the appendix, NPs and PAs are also subspecializing outside of primary care at really high rates. So the same pressures that are driving physicians away from primary care are driving the NP and PA workforce as away as well. So really until we fix the work environment, we really are at risk of stalling the growth of this workforce in the future. <clears throat> but there is a ray of hope when we look at primary care's distribution in areas of need. We used a measure of area level disadvantage created at the Robert Graham Center called the Social Deprivation Index or SDI to examine whether there was a difference in primary care density in areas of high disadvantage or low dis versus low disadvantage. The SDI is a combination of seven different factors that are outside of healthcare, but impact health. So things like average income of an area, average level of an education in an area. Here we show that primary care clinician density overall in that blue dotted line, that's similar to the line I just showed you. The orange line shows the primary care density in highly disadvantaged areas and the gray line in less disadvantaged areas. So it is promising that primary care clinician density is higher in areas of higher social disadvantage because we know from past literature that patients in these areas have higher medical needs. It remains to be studied, but we hypothesize that one of the reasons we are seeing this is because of the Community Health Center program, which aims to put clinicians in areas of highest need, specifically primary care clinicians. But is this sufficient? Likely not. Even the highest density areas are well below the density of family physicians in other areas, in other parts of the world, excuse me. <coughs> also, the difference in PCP density between highly disadvantaged areas and low, low disadvantaged areas is not that large. It's only about 12 PCPs per 100,000 people. We likely need much more than that in these areas of high so social disadvantage given their higher medical needs. So moving on to training, one of the many reasons we are having trouble building a workforce that is robust enough to meet patient needs is that we're not training enough primary care clinicians. Here we're just showing physician training data. In the blue, you see the number of primary care residents per capita and in the orange, all other specialties. Clearly there's been some growth in primary care resident density, 
But if you look at that increasing gap between the orange and blue lines, you can see that primary care resident density is not growing as fast as resident density in all other specialties, despite the fact that primary care really is the backbone of our healthcare system. To add to this worrisome figure is the fact that only a small percentage of those primary care residents actually train out in the community. Additional data that you find in the scorecard report shows that most re residents, even within primary care, are spending a majority of their time training in large academic medical centers or hospitals, even though we know that most primary care is happening in community-based settings. This is worrisome to us because we know that how and where you train really does determine how and where you practice. And that simple fact about the setting where you train impacting how you practice after residency can be demonstrated in this figure where we show what percentage of residents actually end up practicing true primary care. What we know is that just because a physician trains in primary care, it does not mean they actually enter primary care practice after graduation. Many, particularly in internal medicine and pediatrics, end up going into fellowships and subspecializing. So here, what we did was we looked at the percentage of physician residents who actually entered a practice in primary care at least three years after residency. The blue lo line shows the percentage of primary care physicians, including those that do mainly hospital medicine, and the orange line shows the percentage that enter primary care when we exclude hospitalists. And it's pretty alarming that only between 11 and 15% of all residents in the United States actually enter outpatient primary care practice. We do see that blip in the orange line in 2021. We think that's being driven by a decrease in the number of graduates who wanted to do hospital only medicine in the midst of the pandemic. But as we recalibrate our data post to a post pandemic state, we predict that orange line will go back down to the 11, 12% range. <clears throat> Reason three that patients are seeing a problem with access has to do with payment and specifically our investment in as a nation in primary care. So here I show the results for our narrow definition of primary care investment by payer. All payers together are the orange, uh, sorry, the blue line. The orange line is commercial. The gray line is Medicaid and the yellow line is Medicare. You can see that there has been some fluctuation over the years, but overall, investment in primary care for everyone is low. And the highest that we're getting is 8%. That looks like it was a blip in 2013 for commercial spend. Otherwise we're landing between 4.7 um, to about 6.5%, which is clearly not enough. Other developed nations that have much better health outcomes, higher life expectancy, are spending at least double this on their primary care infrastructure. So I think one of the reasons that we are seeing all these problems in terms of retaining people in primary care um, or even having new graduates go into primary care is we're just not investing enough in our primary care practices. Our primary care practices are clearly overworked, underfunded, and under-resourced. <clears throat> so I've told you the workforce is not sufficient to meet demands. Our training is inadequate to replace our workforce. We are not investing enough in primary care. What about technology? Can it deliver on its potential to improve access in primary care? The answer is likely not in its current form. In fact, data taken from the American Board of Family Medicine shows that nearly half of family physicians rate EHR usability poor or fair, and more than one third of family physicians were not satisfied with their EHR. So instead of technology helping to expand access by providing an additional means of communication and coordination of healthcare, the way it currently is designed only seems to be an added burden. 
And finally, on the national level, why are things not getting better in primary care? We simply are not investing enough in researching novel methods of care delivery and payment. In fact, federal research investment in primary care, and this includes funding from the NIH, the CDC, ARC, and FDA, is only 0.31% of total research dollars. So although primary care is the largest delivery platform of healthcare in the United States, we spend less than 1% actually studying it. So let me take us back to the title of our report, Why Can't Anyone See You Now? I think on the national level, it all boils down to a lack of investment, both monetarily and non-monetarily in primary care. We are not investing in solutions to grow and sustain our workforce at levels needed to meet patient demands. We are not investing in policies that could impact the training pathways, particularly for physicians. We have an actual lack of monetary investment in primary care practices to support infrastructure and teams. We are not investing in the creation of digital health that can help ease the workload for primary care instead of making it harder. And we really are not investing research dollars to study models of care delivery and payment solutions. So on the national level, until we decide that it's time to act and invest more in primary care, patients will continue to be told that no one can see them now. Now we know all of this is really tough to move on a federal level, which is why it's so important that we also focus on what is happening at the local levels. So I wanted to take a moment to look at some of these metrics at the state level to see how Washington is doing compared to the rest of the nation. I'll say I was pleasantly surprised. So for the next several slides that I'm showing, the solid line will always be Washington state and the dotted line will be a national average. You'll notice that some of the national lines look different than when I showed you previously. The numbers are not different. It's just the scales that are different so that we could do a comparison with the states. So let's start with the percent of the population without a usual source of care. That was our first slide on the national level. <clears throat> In Washington, you can see here that they, you guys are actually doing better than the national average in terms of people who report that they do not have a usual source of care. The other thing about Washington that I noticed here is that the people who report not accessing a usual source of care, both for children in blue and adults in green, is pretty steady, actually, unlike the nation where, unfortunately, those who report not having a usual source of care is rising. In the state of Washington, it looks like there has been a pretty steady level of around 22% of adults reporting that they do not have a usual source of care, which is less than the national average, which is great. And for children, it's 7% in um, the most recent year for the state of Washington that do not have a usual source of care. The national average is double this. So all this tells me is that in general, Washington seems to be doing a much better job getting patients in to see their usual source of care. But we can also look at this another way. So still in Washington, we have one in five adults who don't have access to a usual source of care and almost one in 10 children who don't. What about when we look at the actual workforce that is available to provide care? Again, it looks like Washington is above the national average or doing better than the national average in terms of primary care physicians per 100,000 population. Washington has about 77 um, per 100,000 people in terms of primary care physicians in 2021, whereas the national level was closer to 67 primary care physicians per 100,000 people. And although Washington is doing better than the national average, these numbers are still nowhere near where they need to be compared to international averages where we know that health outcomes are better because they have a more robust primary care workforce. Again, when we add in nurse practitioners and PAs to the mix, we see that Washington's primary care workforce is growing. It's higher than the national average. 
Something that I noticed that was a little interesting here, though, is that um, if you look between 2020 and 2021, the national numbers seem to be growing at a faster rate um, than the Washington numbers. So we'll have to see in 2022 and 2023 whether these lines end up meeting up. And when we look at the distribution of primary care clinicians in the state of Washington, you guys are actually doing a pretty good job of distributing clinicians in areas of highest need. So the red lines here represent communities that are below the social deprivation index, meaning that they have less social disadvantage or looking at it another way, they have more social advantage. You tend to have less primary care clinicians in these areas than the national average does. Instead, it really does seem like a lot of your primary care clinicians are clustered in areas that are above the median social deprivation index, meaning that primary care clinicians are working in those areas of greatest social needs. Now, it's not to say that everyone doesn't need access to primary care. Everyone does, but like I said before, we know that patients who live in areas of higher social need also tend to have more complex healthcare needs. They need to see their clinician more regularly in order to maintain good health. So what this says to me is that the state of Washington is actually doing a good job distributing their limited human resources where it's most needed. Doctor, you have a can ask a question about those? Da -da. Yeah, yeah, uh, go for it. Yeah, quick question. Is this based on zip code, city, county data? Uh, this is great. So what we did was we took uh, zip, data, zip, zip code tabulation area data and rolled it up to the state. So we calculated basically all the zip does that were the primary care clinician and all the zip does that were below the median SDI of the state and above the median SDI of the state. Does that answer the question? Yeah. And that's great to hear. Thank you. Yeah. I have a quick question. <laughs> yeah. If you use STI, which I think is by zip code, why not do it, keep it clustered by zip code when you did that, as opposed to using the state's SDI average? So we did this mostly because of technical reasons. So we can't, so we have a dashboard that we needed to present and the way that the data needed to go in the dashboard could only be done at the state level. Otherwise it looked too messy. So that's why we rolled everything up to the state level. Does that make sense? So it's really just for a technical reason in terms of how the dashboard is presented. If we were going to do this, for example, for a research paper, we would absolutely do what you're talking about. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Any more questions before I move on? And I'm happy to go back to slides at the end too and answer questions. OK. So let's look at the pipeline of what's coming in to the future of Washington. So here we look at the number of primary care residents per 100,000 people in Washington compared to the rest of the United States. And here it seems like Washington is below the national average. So maybe you aren't training as many primary care medical residents per capita as the rest of the nation is. This is important just because we know that people end up about 50 miles from where they are trained. Most doctors do. So if you want to build a robust workforce in the future, the goal would be to train more people in primary care in the state. So compared to the national average of 17 primary care residents per 100,000 population, Washington is about 12 primary care residents per 100,000 population. But what Washington is doing a better job of is retaining those residents they do have in their primary care workforce. Again, this data tracks residents at least three years after graduation to make sure that they are not um, one, hospitalist, and two, now a subspecialist, but that they are actually working in primary care. It looks like for Washington in the latest year, 28% of your total new physician workforce uh, was working in primary care for the national average that was around 21%. If you consider that historically we quote that about 30% of all physicians are in primary care, Washington actually seems to be holding to that trend. 
and perhaps um, not replacing the workforce that is leaving. But the question is with the pandemic, excuse me, and other forces that are really driving people out earlier than expected, is this entrance into primary care actually enough to replace the primary care physicians that are leaving? So something that was not part of the scorecard, but that we ran quickly um, using the AMA master file um, for Washington was to look at um, primary care physicians per 100,000 entering, exiting, and the net. Entering, I already explained how we did that. That's the blue line. For exiting, what we did was we assumed a retirement age of 65 and looked through the AMA master file for those who were 65 and counted them or above and counted them as exiting. Now I know we all know many doctors who are still like 85, 90 who are practicing, but we also all know a lot of doctors who are younger than 65 who have left full-time practice. So I think this is even though this is theoretic numbers, this is probably pretty close to what the actual numbers would show. And that green line is the net, which means that it does not look like you are replacing um, primary care physicians at an adequate rate. So this is something to track for your workforce in the future to see if the workforce numbers start to dwindle as those exiting outpace those who are entering. And finally, let's end with probably the most important thing, which is how we pay. I say the most important thing because, again, if we're not investing enough, there's no way to build teams that can attract enough people to want to be in primary care. Instead, we just have these overworked, under-resourced primary care offices, which doesn't fare well for retention or recruitment. Here, I would say that using our methodology and our data source, which is the medical expenditure panel survey, Washington is actually about equal to the nation in terms of low investment in primary care. Um, Washington is spending about 5.1% overall on primary care. The national average is 4.7%. I don't show it here, but you can find it in that interactive dashboard I was talking about. Your commercial spend is 5.4%, which is similar to the national average. Your Medicare spend is 4.9%, which is actually a lot higher than the, a lot, a, a, at least a percent higher than the national average. And your Medicaid spend is 5.6%, which is also higher than the national average by a little bit. So when we put this all together, what does it mean for the state of Washington? I think it means your workforce currently is still better than the national average, but it's still not enough. And there are trends that you should probably watch in terms of how many are entering versus how many are leaving practice. This would be important to make sure that you are training a robust enough workforce in primary care. You do have more retention of your residents in Washington meaning that you have a higher percentage of new entrants that are um, in primary care than the national average. Um, but again, something to keep an eye on to see if that's enough to replace the workforce that's leaving. And just like <coughs> at the national level, um, the lack of investment um, to support teams is there. So what can we do about what is happening on the national level and the state level? I'll take us back to our five reasons and offer some basic solutions. So to build a robust workforce, let's reduce the admin burden. Let's shift payment policies to support teams um, and support payment policies that are not just based on a fee-for-service chassis. Let's invest in incentive programs and redesign GME payments so that payments aren't just going to hospitals because we know that training residents in hospitals doesn't result in a primary care workforce. Um, met, we need to measure and increase primary care spend at the state level. This is important to even just start with the measurement at your state level, see where you are so that you can track growth. And we need to move away from fee-for-service. 
we need to develop digital health and certification standards that align with the functions of primary care. And I will say that as AI is developing, we really need primary care clinicians sitting at the table to develop and implement those AI systems within the healthcare system. Because if we're not sitting at the table, we're going to have the same results that we had with the EHR, which is a glorified billing platform that is being used mostly for hospital care. And we need to advocate for increased funding opportunities for primary care within NIH and other government agencies. So here is the implementing high quality primary care report for those of you who haven't read it, because as I said, our five objectives and measures are all based on that. Um, all of the data and more that I presented can be found at millbank.org. And um, you'll also find your state's dashboard, which has more data about Washington. So thank you very much. I'm gonna end here and take any additional questions. Thanks, Dr. Gilbert. Um, I think there's some questions probably in the chat, and we'll take some questions from uh, you. And I'll just say thank you for the, the presentation and uh, the number of uh, sort of salient points is a lot to sort of process. I think as your, uh, you know, as a practicing family doc, of all this sort of data and all these insights, which is there anything that to you really sort of strikes a chord more than any of the others? So I think, you know, I, I think I said it um, over and over again, but the primary care spend measure is the one that I think is impacting all the others. So I think that's what stands out to me is how much we are under investing in primary care in the United States. The other thing, that sticks out is on the national level, the fact that only 12% of um, only 12% of all residents in the United States that we are tra training actually go into outpatient primary care, and and that just boggles my mind, knowing that that's where most patients seek care, right? Is in the outpatient primary care space, but only 12% of our physicians who are training go into that. Space. Well, on that note, I'll give the first question here in the room to one of our residents, uh, Dr. McCauley. Uh, yeah, thank you for the presentation. And it was interesting hearing you uh, comparing the US's health outcomes and data to other countries. And I'm curious of uh, the five recommendations that you made for the US to begin with reform. Are there any of those that you saw most closely correlated with better health outcomes in other countries and places where this is already being done and models that we could go off of? That's a great question. I think, again, I will go back to primary care investment only because <laughs> I, I that is that investing more in primary care is also going to lead to a more robust workforce. Um, and more people choosing primary care. So I think it all comes back to the investment. So if you look at, there are great, um, there's great d data online that will kind of line up the OECD countries or the developed countries in terms of how much they are spending on primary care and also health outcomes. And it's just associations, but you can see a pretty direct association between how much a country is spending on primary care and what their health outcomes look like. Hmm. I think I see some people online too, Josh. I don't, I can't see the people in the room, but I see some people with questions online. Dr. Crittenden. Hi, thank, thank you very much. I, I, uh, I'm Bob Crittenden, I'm a retired physician now. But, you know, for years we've been working on this issue and caring about it, and the numbers really haven't really changed very much. Uh, the issues haven't changed. And uh, just thinking, uh, you know, yes, we need to have more investment, but how, how do you think, or looking at your view from looking at different states and different countries, what are, what's the kind of our 
uh, what would be a good and effective, I'll call theory of change? What are, what are the buttons we need to push? We have the data and, you know, the data is there and, and it is the you know, insurance companies say it's not their problem. The government, <laughs> we, already, we can't pay more. You go down the list and everybody points to everybody else. Do we have any good examples or ideas on a theory of change to actually start changing that investment and that emphasis? It's a great question. I wish I had a great answer to that. Um, I, I will say, maybe I'm being optimistic, there are some, there is some movement coming out of CMS, um, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, which I think will help this payment issue, not only the investment, but also how we value services in this country, because I think it, it all rolls up to that. So, you know, the current RVU based fee for service system really does not do primary care. Uh, it, it does not do primary care. Well, you know, we need some sort of alternative payment model that is not also just at the hands of primary care to be checking boxes to say that they're providing value-based care. We need a robust upfront capital going to primary care practices so that they can build teams, so that they can take care of the patient population, so that when trainees come through, they see, oh, this is a great practice. This is the, the type of place I want to work. These physicians look like the type of physician I want to be. Um, CMS has some, um, some new proposed mechanisms in their new proposed fee schedule that would actually value primary care the way it should be valued. Is it enough? Probably not, but it does seem like CMS is listening. And, and why do I think they're listening recently? I do think that there has been some sort of grassroots, almost like patient driven, I can't get in to see my doctor, what is going on? This is ridiculous. I don't know if it was COVID that has caused that or not, but I do think people are sounding alarm bells. And I think, I think CMS is, is listening and trying to, to value primary care the way it should be valued. And as we know, whatever Medicare does, all in, other insurance will follow. So I guess fingers crossed, but who knows? <laughs> Maybe in 10 years, <laughs> Dr. Crittenden will be saying the same thing. So I don't know. <laughs> uh, there's a couple of questions in the chat. Um, one says the clinician trend data over time use head counts. If you were able to measure an FTE instead of head count, do you think the curves would look different? Um, Yes, I do. And that is another limitation that I should have mentioned with the AMA data. We only use headcounts. We don't have a way on a national level to get um, FTE unless we had national level claims, which are very expensive. So um, that is a great point. All right. And one other question. What are your thoughts on payment reform for direct primary care models? Meaning, um, what, what are my, so I think direct primary care is, has been shown to benefit, right, the primary care physician. I think it, it retains people in primary care. Primary care physicians are happier. The patients who are in those models um, are happier. The question is, if everyone moved to direct primary care, would we have enough of a workforce to meet all the demands of every patient in the country? Correct. Um, Dr. Jabbarpour, your, your analysis about primary care suggests almost that we have become an outpatient specialty. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and certainly then the challenge for general internal medicine is they have become almost an inpatient specialty. Mm -hmm. and, and I guess my, my worry is that these types of analytics, um, have, have we given up on, on the notion of primary care transcending the location of care and being wherever the patient is? Uh, I think, 
Yeah, it's a great point. And we do it, you know, um, for simplicity's sake, just because of the, the kind of the breadth of this report. Um, have we given up? Hopefully not. But again, if we look at the ABFM scope of practice data, we do see that scope of practice is shrinking. Um, you know, the, the physician who does outpatient, inpatient, and OB care um, is rare and is, you know, mostly in rural areas or academic health centers. Um, and is that right? No, it's not right. That's not what we want to advocate for, but it's the way the trends are moving. So then when we measure workforce on a national level, we do have to consider that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Just a quick thought, I know we're about out of time, but it would be really neat to see you, I, I know you can't get FTE, but use a proportion of the number of visits people have yeah. by, by body, right? And just at least have a proxy for the FTE, because I think Sue's point in the chat's a good one that she followed up and saying, you know, that she suspects that there'd be significantly less um, what we see compared to, to the head counts, because more- Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And we're trying to find a way to do that. We, so for visits, we could use the um, medical expenditure panel survey data, but um, the best way to do this would be with claims data. And um, we just can't afford to buy national level claims data from like IQVIA or HCCI or IBM Watson, but it, it is a great idea for someone who has access to those types of data sets. Even with the secure enclaves, you know, I think there's potential. So anyway, just planting that seed for the Robert Grant folks. <laughs> that would be awesome. Thank you. Yeah. 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 I think we're good. Thank you very much for joining and we'll see you all next month. Okay. Thank you guys. Bye.